Okay, in today's lecture, uh, we will take a look at the relationship between uh, two numerical variables. Uh, a couple of lectures ago, we actually looked at uh, the test, chi-squared test for independence, right? And uh, in this lecture, actually, we discussed um, how two different categorical variables uh, can be tested if, <coughs> um, uh, if, if, if they have a relationship between them. In other words, if um, um, the um, if if both uh, uh, if different levels of uh, of one categorical variable follow uh, the same distribution at, uh, as as other levels of the same categorical uh, variable or not. Uh, so in this lecture, we're going to uh, take a look at the case when uh, both of our variables x and y are numerical. So. <coughs> if you uh, if you want this uh, uh, material, simple uh, linear regression is going to be the analog of uh, chi-square test for independence, but uh, for the case of mm, uh, numerical variables. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. First of all, let's uh, discuss uh, a very important uh, idea of the uh, co coefficient of correlation. So, coefficient of correlation is a single number uh, that by itself characterizes to what degree, uh, to what, uh, what, 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 what would be the, um, uh, the strength of the relationship between two variables, x and y. Uh, the possible values that co coefficient of correlation can take range, it's continuous actually range, from minus 1 to plus 1. So, minus 1 and plus 1 are extreme. <coughs> uh, plus 1 indicates that Two variables x and y are perfectly correlated and the relationship between them is positive that means that if x goes up uh, then the y goes up as well minus one uh, does exactly the same thing but for the negative relationship it's a perfect uh, relationship uh, but when x goes up y drops y goes down and if the coefficient of correlation is zero that means that x and y are not really related so therefore knowing the variable x does not tell you anything about the variable y okay and let me um let me tell you how is that uh relevant well maybe hold on it will have yeah examples we're going to have them later okay so for now let's discuss uh what the uh what uh, does that mean to have correlation between two variables so i used that side before to illustrate the ideas behind um, different statistical uh, tests and concepts so <coughs> here what we can do is um, we can change the uh, correlation between two variables and you can see right right here we have a bunch of points right in uh, um, in a two-dimensional uh, coordinates x two-dimensional space and y so uh, it can be anything really for example let's say um, let, 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 let's say uh, the example that we're going to actually use uh, so let me start from here okay from uh, perfect negative uh, correlation between mileage on the car and the price of the car so we know that for the cars with low mileages <coughs> the price is supposed to be higher right and as the mileage on the car goes up the car is more and more used the uh, the mileage uh, uh, the mileage goes up the the price goes down right so this is a well-known relationship so this is an example when uh, the relationship between X mileage and Y price is uh, perfectly normal uh, perfectly linear <coughs> what does that mean <coughs> that means that all the points you can see that I have how many points by the way uh, sample size 50 okay well let me go ahead and get a hundred because I believe the example that we're going to take a look at today uh, has actually 100 cars. So each point represents one car, okay? So if I take any point like this, for example, the extreme one, then <coughs> X is the amount of miles on the car, and uh, Y is the price of this car. So each car can be characterized by these two numbers simultaneously, right? The mileage and the price. Now, this is idealized um, scenario, right? <laughs> which basically says that there is a perfectly linear relationship so knowing the mileage of the car can precisely predict you the price okay so for example if I um, 
if I want to, let's see if I can use that one. So if I want to look at the card with, no, it doesn't work that way, right? I was thinking if I'm going to change this number here, um, then it will, it will move to the, well, actually, yeah, it does, right? It, it, it did move to the 15. And that would be the, the predicted price of the car. So car with 15,000 miles costs close to $40,000. That must be some upscale car, right? <coughs> so this is an idealized scenario where knowing the X, we can exactly predict Y. Of course, in actuality, that doesn't happen, but we're going to discuss that a little bit later, okay? So uh, let's see what will happen if I will start um, adding some randomness to the points. So for example, right here, I'm going to start reducing the coefficient of correlation. And you can see that right now I'm standing at 0.96, right? So I can still see that uh, in general, this relationship holds pretty well, right? Um, increasing the mileage <coughs> will uh, decrease the, uh, the the variable y, the price, okay? But now it does not follow exactly the same uh, relationship. So for the same mileage, right? So 15, for example, thousand right? miles right here, <coughs> I can have different cars with different prices, right? Now I'm going to continue adding a little bit jitter uh, randomness to, to my points. And you can see that as I spread points more, right, so there is more variability in points, so now they feed um, uh, the straight line worse and worse, <coughs> uh, my coefficient of correlation goes down. So right now I'm looking at point minus point 0.92. But still I can see that general trend is um, x goes up, y goes down. Okay, so let me actually make a little bit more drastic change. So right now I have 0.8 correlation coefficient. Still I can see that, yeah, there is a big uh, variability among the points, even for the same value of x, right? Uh, there, there are all kinds of possible values of y. But uh, I can still see that x goes up, y goes down. So let me move to a 0.6. Now my relationship is get, getting substantially worse, right? Uh, how about 0 0.4? 0 0.4, uh, it, it almost looks like a random cloud of points, right? In general, yes, I can see that there are <coughs> more points in the uh, in this quadrant and then this quadrant and in the other two, right? So overall, x goes up, y goes down, but now it's kind of uh, very obscure. What happens if I have 0.2? When my coefficient of correlation is minus 0.2, right, I can barely see any kind of relationship. So it looks like a random cloud of points to me. What happens if the coefficient of correlation is perfect zero, right? Perfect zero. Now I I don't have any sense of direction in this random cloud of points, right? So in other words, <coughs> knowing the value of x, the predictor, okay, my uh, variable x mileage does not allow me to calculate the uh, variable y, which is the price, right? So for any values of x, I can pretty much see the same possible range of different prices, right? So uh, when the coefficient of correlation is equal to zero, then uh, we're going to say that there is no relation, uh, linear relationship between variables x and y. They're, they're not dependent on each other somehow, right? Well, let's see now what happens if I start getting into the positive area. So now my coefficient of correlation is 0.2. Still, I don't see, <coughs> quite frankly, a lot of, you know, structure, right? So it still seems like random cloud of points. Or maybe it starts to shape along the, um, you know, uh, along this diagonal. <coughs> so let's see what happens if I, I get it to 0.4. Now I can start seeing the pattern, right, that merges. X goes up, Y goes up as well. What about 0.6? Okay, 0.6. <coughs> uh, now my relationship between x and y is even better, right? So I can clearly see the trend, even though there is a lot of variability exists, right? How about 0 0.8? 0 0.8 actually is pretty decent, right? So my correlation, well, it's not exactly 0.8, but close. Um, so <coughs> I can clearly uh, see that if x in is increasing, y is also increasing, right? So that's even better. Well, let's see 0.9, okay? 0.9 is, <coughs> excuse me, looking very decent. X goes up, Y goes up, and uh, let's go to the extreme case when it's perfect one. 
So um, it's a positive slope for the straight line, right? That connects all of my points and they do form the, the straight line. So now if I know the value of the mileage X, I can predict precisely the price of the car, the Y, right? But that's the idea behind the coefficient of correlation. If I have a bunch of points and each point is characterized with some sort of the <coughs> two measures, such as, for example, the car has mileage and the price, right? How much the car will cost on the on the open market? I can plot uh, each point in the two dimensional uh, on the two dimensional plane in x y coordinate, and uh, what I will receive actually it's, it's a very powerful uh, statistical plot, uh, very popular <coughs> when I'm looking at the relationship between two variables x and y. Both of them are numerical. Then uh, the plot that will allow me to judge if such relationship exists or not. It's called scatter plot, and obviously we're going to look at the scatter plot in just uh, uh, in just a few seconds. Okay, so now let's go back to the to the lecture. So <coughs> now that we looked at the coefficient of correlation, and we know that it changes from uh, from minus one to plus one. Okay, let's uh, discuss strength, uh, informal way to judge uh, correlation strength. Formal way to judge correlation strength. So uh, let's adopt the following sort of um, uh, way of thinking about correlations. Uh, if my coefficient of correlation r is close to either plus one or minus one, <coughs> that is the strongest correlation that can exist. Okay. In this case, I'm going to say that x and y are perfectly uh, linearly related. Okay. X goes up, I know exactly by how much Y will go up or down, depending on the sign of the coefficient of correlation. So therefore, values <coughs> for the coefficient of correlation, which are close to plus 1 or minus 1, I'm going to call strong. Okay, And in this case, relationship between X and Y is strong. Well, uh, again, R can be on the plus side or on the minus side, right? So the closer it is to plus 1 or minus 1, the better. So uh, let's call relationship to be strong if the absolute value <coughs> absolute value takes care of the minus sign right if the absolute value of the coefficient of correlation is between 0.7 and 1 so in other words it's between 0.7 and plus 1 or minus 0.7 and minus 1 then in such case i'm going to uh, say that x and y are strongly related okay um lower values kind of the mid-range values so let's adopt this uh, schema, right? If the absolute value of the coefficient of correlation is between 0.3 to 0.7, we're going to say that medium relationship exists between two variables, x and y. And again, it can be either positive 0 0.7, 0 0.3 to 0 0.7, or negative 0.3 to negative 0.7. Either way, we're going to say that <coughs> the relationship between x and y is medium. And finally, if the uh, coefficient of correlation is between negative 0.3 and positive 0.3, so it's around zero, doesn't matter on which side, positive or negative, then we're going to say that such, in such case variables x and y are uh, very weakly related, or if coefficient of correlation is perfect zero, they're not related at all. And you saw the example, right? So <coughs> again, uh, this is what we did, right? So if I... Uh, put the coefficient of correlation to zero, that means that, yeah, there is no no pattern, right? So x is just a bunch of numbers, and y is just a bunch of numbers, and all of that looks like a random cloud of points, so if I know the value of x, I'm not going to be able to predict the value of y at all, okay? That's why I'm saying that if the coefficient of correlation is zero, then x and y are not related to each other. Okay, beautiful. <coughs> So, uh, the idea behind regression analysis, uh, which is also called linear regression analysis, is to uh, analyze if uh, variables uh, are uh, linearly, are related to each other in a linear way. So, uh, there are two types of um, variables in, in these uh, problems, okay? I'm always, so uh, every time when I'm going to talk about 
a linear regression. <coughs> that means that I'm trying to predict the value of a certain variable, which I'm going to call dependent. Dependent because its value will, will depend on other variables. For example, cars, right? Um, uh, if, if I'm talking about the prices and the mileages, I know that <coughs> price is primarily driven by the mileage, right? I mean, there are other uh, factors as well, no question about that. But probably the strongest predictor of the um, car's price is the mileage. Uh, so in this case, the price is my dependent variable. I'm going to call it Y. Uh, sometimes also dependent variable, uh, aka also known as target. That's what I'm predicting. And other things that I'm using to predict the target, uh, X1, I can have many of them. Okay, in this uh, uh, lecture, we're going to <coughs> consider the case when there is only one uh, variable, X, that predicts the value of the target. But in general, I can have many, pre uh, many variables X, right? So X1, X2, I can have as many as I want. The X variables are called also independent variables. And I'm going to put here AKA, <coughs> also known as predictors. Okay, predictors. So I'm using predictors, in my case it's a mileage, to predict the target. Okay, so, and I'm going to put it in quotations. All right, very good. So dependent variable, there is always one dependent variable. Target is always one. But I can have as many predictors as I want. Okay, in fact, we're going to discuss in the next, um, after we're done with this uh, lecture, with this PowerPoint deck, we'll take a look at the case when <coughs> I have many different predictors. Okay, and uh, the common wisdom basically dictates that the more predictors I have, the more independent variables I have, the better I can predict my target, right? Because in this case, I'm taking into consideration uh more and more aspects of um of the real real life scenario okay so uh, in this lecture in this powerpoint deck we're going to concentrate primarily on something that's called simple linear regression why simple simple <coughs> is uh, we call it simple because uh, there is only one predictor so uh, like in our example uh, cars uh, prices are predicted based only on the uh, on the mileage of the car okay so of course this is simplified uh, model right but anyhow this is this is going to be just illustration how the uh, linear regression works okay uh, this is one of the most powerful and most frequently used uh, ways to model the relationships uh, between uh, different variables okay so the applications of this method are plentiful in uh, economics for example in economics right uh, demand for the product for, such as for the new houses can depend on a lot of things but one uh, parameter that probably defines uh, demand for the houses is interest rates right mortgage interest rates and mortgage interest rates uh, obviously are uh, related, they're linked with the uh, Federal Reserve um, interest rates, right? So this is the main um, main parameter, if you will, of the economy that is established by um, well, Federal Reserve in the United States, by the European Central Bank in the uh, Eurozone, etc., etc. So uh, we can collect, um, you know, the, the values from different years, what was the interest rate and how many houses were bought in the economy and try to predict, depending on the interest rates, how many houses will be bought uh, in the future. So that's one example. Uh, sales uh, of the uh, price for the house and square footage. Actually, that's going to be exactly the example that we're going to discuss when talking about multiple linear regression. We have many predictors, not just one x variable but many x variables uh probably one of the strongest predictors for the price of the house is how big is the house right how how many square feet the house has so that's another uh use uh, sales of the product uh, in marketing and advertising right 
uh, sales of the product for the company can uh, depend on how much money they're spending on advertising, such as product advertising, brand awareness advertising. So I can collect, you know, um, advertising budgets data and the sales right after I conduct my uh, advertising campaign and try to establish a relationship. Okay, what happens if I uh, increase the advertising budget by, let's say, ten thousand dollars? What kind of increase in the sales can I expect from that? So that also can be uh, uh, analyzed using simple linear regression. Uh, and uh, another one is um, this one right here. Okay, um, <coughs> a lot of times universities when they uh, uh, accept uh, candidates, well prospective students, right? Um, they ask them, and you know that because you, you've been in this uh, situation before, when you apply to CNU, or anybody applies to any other university, one of the things that the university uh, requires you to submit is the standardized score such as SAT, right? Well, when you apply to the graduate school such as MBA program, they also require you to test standardized test called uh, GMAT, General Management Aptitude Test. And um, this test score is used uh, as one of the inputs how uh, admission uh, office in the universities uh, decides uh, who should be accepted and who should be rejected from the university. So how exactly they judge? Um, at least one way, right? How it can be done. Uh, university wants to accept good students, right? So if university will accept students who will not perform well in the classes and get bad GPAs, mm, nothing good is going to come out of that, right? Graduates will be unhappy because they will not be able to find the job, so they will spread bad word, bad reputation about the university. So therefore, and one, one thing that <coughs> universities can um, judge how well uh, a student is doing is their uh, GPA, right? So, for example, let's say GPA at the end of their senior year. Okay, so what I can do as the admissions officer in the university is uh, collect a bunch of data on students from the past, right? I know everything about them. I know what their SAT score or GMAT, right? Doesn't matter. Some entrance exam score uh, was when I accepted students into the university. And uh, what was their GPA at the end of their senior year when they graduated and finally entered the job market, right? So I have basically uh, about each person who graduated, I can use two data points, right? What was their SAT score or GMAT score when I accepted them? That's number one input. And number two, uh, what was their GPA when they were about to graduate at the end of their last semester? And because I collected a whole bunch of data points, right, I can go ahead and run some sort of the model and try to predict the GPA for the student that I accept based on the um, exam uh, scores when uh, when they just apply. See, uh, th th this is the use of this model. Uh, when university accepts a student, nobody really knows, including the students themselves, how well or how badly they will perform, right? The future GPA is a big mystery. Nobody can predict that. But we can, to a certain degree, at least try to forecast <coughs> how uh, different students will perform in, in, in their classes. What, uh, what, what do we have at our disposal? Well, standardized test scores, SAT for undergraduate students. Then we have GMAT uh, or GRE um, for uh, for incoming uh, graduate students. Then we have, of course, such thing as, um, for example, high school GPA, right? This is another input that can be used. So the standardized uh, test score, such as SAT, is not the only input. But that can be a pretty good predictor of how well or how badly students will do when they accept it to the university, right? And uh, that's actually the value gain of this model is that we're going to try and predict the performance of uh, each of the students uh, even without having any insight into the future, right? So we don't know how, if they are going to perform badly or, or nicely, uh, but using the standardized test scores, we can at least try and predict um, their GPA in the future.
before anybody knows that. And that's the real value of these models. Okay. So uh, it would be nice to have a model like uh, this. All right. Like this, for example. That's something that uh, we would call deterministic model, right? Once you know the value of x, it gives you precisely the value of y. So when correlation is perfect, uh, we know precisely what the uh, uh, dependent variable, target variable, is going to be. So, uh, for example, for the house, right? Uh, so uh, why uh, why uh, such model is, is important for housing market? Every time when you or somebody else buys the house, <coughs> they need to know what's the value of the house, right? So for that uh, reason, uh, each time when the house is placed on the market for sale, uh, a sp specially trained uh, real estate assessors, uh, they have to come in, look at the house, look at the other houses in the neighborhood, and find out, you know, what would be the fair price of this house in this neighborhood today, okay? So one way how the uh, price of the house can be determined is based on the square footage. We just discussed uh, not so long ago that uh, house size, such as square footage, right, can be pretty good predictor of what the house is worth, right? Small houses probably not uh, are not that expensive as large houses. So it would be nice to have model like that. Okay, so seventy-five dollars per square foot plus twenty-five thousand dollars for the for the land, for example, right? Each house it needs to be built on the land, obviously. So therefore, if you have, let's say, a thousand square feet house, multiply, so the X, right? Square footage is 1,000, multiplied by 75, add 25, and you get yourself prediction, right? So if you have a house 100,000 uh, square feet, that house is going to be 20, uh, 25 plus 100,000 worth, okay? No ifs, buts, uh, done deal okay so in this case our model will look like this right deterministic okay once you know the house size you can precisely predict the house price well reality is a little bit different okay so each time when you know the house size let's say this is a thousand or whatever that might be okay uh, and you look at the all the houses on the market that have exactly that house size okay thousand square feet you will see a range of prices Okay, um, so why uh, is there, uh, why are there different uh, prices? For the same house size, there are different prices, right? If houses are the same uh, in terms of size, okay, what, uh, what, what's the matter? Why do they cost differently? Uh, well, square footage, the size of the house, is not the only uh, important feature of the house, right? Uh, if you ask any real estate uh, agents, they'll tell you what's the first uh, rule of real estate. It's location, location, and location, right? So if the house is in the bad neighborhood uh, with high crime rate, for example, right, and uh, bad public school system, doesn't matter if it's large or is it small, it's not going to fetch a lot of money, okay? And at the same time, if the house is in the upscale neighborhood with, you know, higher average incomes, it's going to be more expensive. So location is the factor, okay? Uh, then lot size. Sometimes, even if the house is small, but it has a lot of land around that, the price is still high, just because, you know, it comes with uh, with big property, right? Um, house type can be, uh, can, can also play the role, right? Uh, probably townhomes, townhouses, even if they're of the same size as regular, detached house they're probably going to be less expensive well because you have neighbors living literally right next door to you right as opposed to detached kind of it's the single uh, single family home right sitting on its own plot of land then it could be that the factor is um how many stories in the house so one story buildings versus two story versus three story building right uh is it a uh uh uh, vinyl siding versus the uh, brick walls that is also going to be important right um, if the house has the pool uh, on the on the land its value is going to to go up probably at least ten thousand dollars if not more than that right 
If the house is a waterfront property, if it sits on the banks of the river or the lake, it tends to be more expensive for obvious reasons, right? Um, if inside I have, for example, hardwood floors as compared to um, carpeting, hardwood floors probably are more expensive, right? Uh, if, uh, if the house has the nicely done renovation inside, okay, how old are the appliances? So all these factors, uh, they influence the uh, price of the house. And that's why for each house size, I'm going to see a different range of house prices because there are other things, okay, that are uh, at play. So realistically, you will see something like this, okay, when talking about house size versus house price okay and this is actually a good example of positively uh, of positive relationship right in the previous case when we talked about cars versus mileages it was a negative relationship right mileage goes up price goes down with cars it's different uh, with houses it's different if the house uh, is getting bigger say everything else remains the same but house uh, is getting extra square footage like for example let's say you you decided to call the um, contractors and uh, have an addition to your house, right? Build an extra room, right? Extra wing, so to speak, to the house. That will increase the market value of the house, right? So house size goes up, house price goes up. So in general, you will see trend like that, positive relationship, okay? So uh, that means that we really cannot realistically predict just based on the house size, right? We cannot realistically predict all these variations, right? Even for the same house size, we have a bunch of different prices. But uh, the reason why this lecture is called linear, simple linear regression is we're going to try to capture general trend. So in other words, this red line, right? That kind of cuts through the center of this cloud. Okay, and what do I mean by the center of this cloud? <coughs> First, it should have pretty much same slope as the cloud overall, right? That's number one. Number two, center means that uh, on the top of this line, I should have about the same number of points as uh, below this line. Okay, so um, uh, in other words, in some cases, I'm going to be underestimating the price, right? So let's say, for example, I have this house size, right? So uh, for this house, I underestimate the price, right? The actual price is right here, this blue dot. But what I predict is right here. Uh, the dot on the red line for this house i'm overestimating the price right so this is the actual price but the price that i predict for this house size is right here okay the dot on the red line so uh i'm going to make errors that's inevitable right so this straight line just simply cannot capture all these blue dots uh, it will capture maybe some of them as you can see right here and maybe right here and maybe this this point as well but the majority of them my prediction is going to be either below or above the actual price, right? What's important is uh, I'm going to have, roughly speaking, half cases under prediction. Uh, in half case, I'm going to under predict the price, right? And in another half of the case, I'm going to over predict the price. So my errors are going to be balanced, right? I'm going to be wrong on both sides, either low side or high side, about 50-50, okay? That's basically what, uh, what my goal is going to be uh in in this uh topic okay trying to model the relationship between x whatever that may be and y whatever that might be all right so therefore uh if i have some jitter right the points but not strictly a line uh along the uh straight line equation along this red line okay and this is what my equation is going to be this is my straight line equation this one right here okay but i know that in order to get the actual house price i have to move points either above from the line or below from the line right so i have to add the error term so epsilon that's a random term random term can result from multiple different factors right it can be things that we did not include uh like why, why uh, the actual price can be different from the one predicted by the straight line equation so error term is essentially is by how much uh, is my prediction off, right? Uh, again, it can be due to other things, right? So the only thing that I'm taking into account is the size of the house. That's my X square footage. I don't uh, include 
the um, other variables such as location, number of bedrooms, type of the house, single, you know, family detached or townhome or is it duplex or something like this, right? Or it can be purely random, okay? So I can just go ahead and today I can, uh, you know, put my house on the market and ask million dollars for that. Nobody's gonna buy that, right? But psh, I can do that. Uh, so random uh, factor, which includes greed sometimes, right? Okay, so um, now let's discuss, let, let, let's let's get kind of closer and closer to the actual topic of, um, to, to the nitty gritty, right? To the mechanics of the simple linear regression. So if I want to predict just the general trend so this red line right equation that gives me a general idea of what the uh, relationship between x and y looks like I'm going to model that as a straight line equation and uh, this is how the straight line equation looks like right mx plus b m is called slope of the straight line and b is called vertical or y intercept okay so uh, and as like as we discussed before let me go ahead and change that to capital X. All right. Uh, as we discussed before, X I'm going to call independent variable uh, or predictor, and Y I'm going to call dependent variable, which depends on X or target. Okay. So if my my target is always going to be one single variable, like house price or car price or GPA of the student at the end of their senior year, right? So I always have only one single target. If I have one single predictor, so I'm modeling uh, car prices as the function, linear function of the car mileage and nothing else, uh, or I'm modeling car uh, house prices as only function of the uh, house size, then I'm going to talk about simple linear regression. So the word simple here indicates that there is only one predictor. There is always one target, but if I have simple linear regression case and I have only one predictor. Uh, just to give you a heads up, later in a couple of lectures we're going to discuss a more realistic and uh, more accurate case. when I can model, for example, the house price based on um, uh, house square footage size uh and lot size so how much land do i have for this house and number of bedrooms and number of stories uh, so if i add more and more and more predictors it's not just x1 it's x1 x2 x3 x4 etc then i'm uh, this uh, is not so simple anymore right so instead of calling it simple linear regression i'm going to call it multiple linear regression so that's going to be our next topic right after this deck of slides okay so here's the big fat question okay let's say a uh, simplified case right so i have x something whatever whatever it is doesn't matter and y whatever it is also doesn't matter and i have only six points right one two three four five six okay so uh and uh i can see if i uh kind of uh if i remove all these lines right so let me actually go ahead and do that oh my god i just removed everything all right so one and this one seems to be resistant. Oh my god, this red one. Oh, it's probably part of the picture. I'm sorry. I'm going to uh, put it back. Right? Okay, so um, if I forget about these lines, and I can see that if x goes up, y also goes up, right? So therefore, generally speaking, x and y are positively related. <laughs> but which which line is the best? Which line is the best fit? Could it be red line? Because you know it kind of cuts through the center, and I have three points below, three points above. But same is true about this green line and about this blue line. Well, blue line probably is not the best, right? I'm guessing because look, I captured two points right here, one points below, three points above. So it's kind of uh, it doesn't really represent my points in a fair way, right? So, but still my question remains, I can draw multiple different options, right? So for example, if I draw a blue line like this, right? Like this, is that a good fit? Maybe, I don't know, three points above, three points below. That's pretty much what I want, right? So which line is the best fit? How do we, um, how do we decide? Well, here is the idea. Uh, 
Okay, so um, let me actually illustrate it right here. Okay, so uh, each time when I draw a line, we discuss that uh, I have errors, right? So this is my line that predicts y, the vertical variable, dependent variable, or target, right? Based on the value of x, okay? Based on the value of the predictors. So here, for example, I have, uh, it's kind of a uh, lucky break, I guess, right? x equals to 1. This is the actual point, the blue point, right? And uh, this point uh, on the red line is what my straight line equation would predict. So I can see that I under predict, right? The actual point is higher. So this is the error, right? I'm off by about, I don't know, roughly speaking by about 3, right? The actual value was about 6 and I predicted 3. Okay. Here, uh, red point again is what I predicted, but this blue point is what the actual data was. And here I over predicted, right? So the error that I made here, that is about 5, this is about 1, so the error here is minus 4, right? Here my error was positive, actual minus the predicted, actual is higher. Here is negative, because actual is less and predicted is more. So here I have negative 4. That one is positive again, that one is negative again. So essentially these distances between the points and what I predict by my straight line equation, these are the errors. Well, statisticians also call them residuals. Okay, we're going to actually discuss residuals a lot in the next couple of lectures, so memorize this word. Residuals is just a fancy way to say error. Okay, by how much my prediction is different from the actual value. So uh, here is the idea: how the uh, how do I pick the best straight line uh, out of all possible options? Uh, when I pick my best fit. Uh, uh, then uh, I want my residuals or errors to be as small as possible. And moreover, I want all of them to be as small as possible, right? I don't want, uh, for example, only this residual to be small and the rest of them whatever, okay? I want all residuals collectively, considered together simultaneously, to be small. But, uh, okay, so uh, we just discussed that these residuals, these errors are positive, right? My actual data is higher than what I predict. All these errors at the bottom, right below the line, are negative. So what will happen if I add all residuals together? Well, positive will be offset by negatives, right? And the sum will look in probably zero or close to zero, right? So this is not a fair way. So you can have actually big errors, big residuals, but if you add them together, they cancel each other and it looks okay. So therefore, what happens is... Uh, the way how the uh, the best line of best fit uh, is constructed is uh, how do I make residuals all positive? Well, I can take absolute value, that's one way, right? Or I can square them. You know that squaring a number, even if it was negative, gives you a positive answer, right? Square of minus 3 is plus 9. So therefore, I take all residuals and square them, add them together. That would be my collective measure of how far away my straight line from the points, right? And I'm going to try and wiggle the, the straight line around. So I'm going to try bigger slope or smaller slope. I'm going to try different values of the y-intercept. So I'm going to move this point where the straight line uh, intersects with the vertical axis up and down, right? And as a result of these manipulations, I'm going to try to set my uh, squared uh, residuals, the sum of squared errors, squared residuals, to the smallest possible value. From this plot, it's obvious that I'm not going to be able to uh, set it to perfect zero, right? Because what does that mean, perfect zero? That means that all residuals, all errors are zeros, right? That means that my straight line goes uh, through each and every one of these points exactly. And that's just not possible, okay? So therefore, I cannot set sum of squared residuals or squared errors exactly to zero. But if I find such slope and such vertical intercept, that uh, gives me the smallest or the least squared residuals, that is my best fit. And that's the idea, basically, how the slope and the intercept are found. And when I'm talking about linear regression model, really, uh, it boils down to can we find the value of the slope and the value of the intercept, right? 
So uh, that's why the best uh, straight line that fits my, my data points is uh, called in statistics least squares line. And by squares we mean square sum of squared residuals. So least squares line. Okay. So with that in mind, we have about seven minutes in this lecture, so let's get started with the problem, right? So car price example, I told you that this is the one that we're going to discuss, right? So uh, price of the car should depend on the odometer reading the mileage. The higher the mileage, the higher the price. No, other way around. The higher the mileage, the lower the price, right? Okay, so a used car dealer recorded the prices in thousands of dollars and odometer readings for 100 uh, four Taurus. Uh, I don't know if we have four Taurus these days. Um, so let's call it four Focus, right? Four Focus cars. I believe Taurus was retired. This is an outdated problem. Okay. Uh, and uh, the mileages are also recorded in thousands of miles. Okay. Can the dealers? Uh, uh, can we use the dealer's data to find a regression line? So in other words, this is what I'm looking for, right? I'm looking to uh, fit in the best straight line that i can to find out so find out such value of the slope m and intercept b mx plus b right such that uh the, uh, the line will represent my uh, points uh, my cars right in the best way okay so uh let's switch our attention now to technology and that would be our studio right so i'm going to call this data set cars data read.csv all right and um the file is traditionally located on the disk c folder data and it's called uh let's try cars prices i can't remember quite frankly what it's called no not car prices uh, let's take a look uh car not cars prices you have to be precise car prices okay like this bam okay so uh let's take a look at the data what does it look like structure of my data frame right every time when i read the data from the file it comes into the memory and that is called data frame right okay car uh cars data like this okay so right here it tells me that um I have 100 cars, right? And we knew that. What do I know about each car? About each car, I know uh, two things, right? Two variables, that means two columns. Column one is called price. Column two is called mileage. So, and these are, uh, each 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 of the pairs, right, of these numbers represents one car, right? So, car number one, the mileage was 37.4 thousand miles, right? Remember, all the prices are in thousands of miles. Uh, so, this is relatively um, unused car, right? So 37.4 is pretty low mileage, okay? And the price for this car, this is for Focus we're talking about, right? 14,000, 14 14.6, and the prices are in thousands of dollars, right? So 14.6 um, thousand dollars, right? So 14,600 bucks. Second car, we had 44.6. Uh, 8,000 miles and the price was 14,100 right etc etc so you get the idea so uh, both my x and what's my x x is independent variable right I can actually spin it in both ways I can use the price to predict the mileage right so I can ask hey how much is this car they'll tell me okay this is $15,000 car and then I'm gonna say hmm based on that I predict that the mileage is going to be uh, 29,000 miles no, it doesn't quite work this way, right? It's opposite, right? When somebody tells you the mileage, you can pretty much tell the price. So in our case, X is going to be the mileage and Y, the dependent variable or target, right? Uh, is going to be the price. Uh, well, first things first. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, let me show you yet another extremely popular plot in statistics. It's called scatter plot. Scatter plot is used in uh, case we have two numerical variables, and we do have two numerical variables, price and mileage, right? And uh, we can plot uh, every point on the scatter plot, right? Because every point has two coordinates, right? Every car has price and the mileage. 
So I'm going to plot mileage as X, my horizontal uh, axis, and the price as Y, my vertical axis, right? This is my dependent variable. So uh, for that, I'm going to use, it's, it's very straightforward uh, function, okay? So yet another graphical tool for you, ladies and gentlemen, it's called scatter plot, okay? Uh, it's done by using just the function plot in R. So I'm going to type, uh, type plot, and uh, you can see uh, that, yeah, plot right here, right? That that is a tooltip, right? It's kind of dynamic help that shows me how exactly the function plot is being used. So this uh, tooltip says that uh, I probably I need to specify because it's going to be a two-dimensional plot, right? X versus Y. I have to specify X for horizontal axis and Y for the vertical axis. Okay. So and there you go. I'm going to say x is equal to, we decided that the x is the mileage, right? So mileage is the uh, column in the data, cars data, and dollar sign mileage, that's my x, and then I'm going to say y equals, same thing, right, cars data, dollar sign, price. And if I run this command, then you can see immediately that I have um, uh, I have what actually I expected to see, right? The cars with low mileages on them, they cost, uh, the, their price tends to be higher, right? But as the mileage goes up higher and higher and higher, the price range starts to come down, right? So the cars on the high end, they kind of occupy the opposite corner of my plot, right? If that price was high, that one is on the low end, okay? That's pretty much what I expect to see. And you can, of course, uh, we saw that before with histograms and bar plots, I believe, you can beautify your um, scatter plot, right? So how exactly? Well, here, I can add the main title, if you remember. We did that for histograms at, our, at the beginning of the semester, right? In our first lecture, so I'm going to say scatter plot, scatter plot of price versus mileage right uh, for x label if you remember x lab right i'm gonna say x label is mileage okay. age and for y lab i'm gonna have price right price okay like this and if i run this uh, line again it updates the plot right so uh, Beautiful. Okay, so uh, let me keep this short. So this is the end of our introductory lecture, okay, into the simple linear regression. So in the next lecture, we're going to get to the nitty gritty. How do we construct the simple linear regression? How we uh, evaluate if this regression, if this relationship between variables is statistically significant or not, etc., etc. Okay, so I'm going to stop it right here. See you in the next lecture.